Hello, audience. Check out these shades. Pretty rad, right? Does anybody know why I'm on stage wearing sunglasses inside like an idiot? Let me give you a hint. You don't know because I have not told you. Communication is important. And without communication, without me explicitly telling you why I'm doing this thing, uh, you're forced to ask questions and make assumptions. Like, what's he up there? Why is he wearing glasses? Is he kind of a jerk? Or is he hungover? Is he crying? What's going on here? Mostly, it's, I thought it would make me look cool. But this is for a point. Like, communication is important. Without communication, you have to go on these wild sprees and make up things for yourself. It's really inefficient. And this goes double for code. Um, code, documentation is your communication in code. And documentation is important, more or less. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, this stuff is really important. This is what we do at GitHub. Um, let me tell you the dirty secret. Humans are not Ruby interpreters. People like to say that, like, yeah, I'm a developer, my code is awesome. No matter what I write, I can easily see, like, everything what I need to know. That's not true. Uh, yes, you can sort of stumble through, but no matter what, if you've spent 5, 10, 15 years writing Ruby, if you've been writing code since 1970, I guarantee you're going to be better at reading English or reading your langu native language or writing that. Um, and that's why I think documentation is really important. And that's why I want to talk about it today. So I'm Zach Holman. I'm Holman on Twitter, Holman on GitHub. I am drinking a fine Boulder beer, so if you throw your tomatoes, uh, don't ruin the beer. I do work for GitHub. Uh, I guess it's like a code host or something. It's like SourceForge, um, sort of. I know you guys like the Twitters. Uh, I know you're going to have the Twitter back channel during my talk. Um, I know you're going to talk about me behind my back. So I'd like to consolidate all that into one hashtag for this talk. So this is the hashtag. It's 139 characters, so make sure your punctuation has been chosen quite well. So let's get into it. If you're like me, you're going to, that's the wrong question to ask. Why should we do this shit? If you're thinking about documentation, why should you do this? What is the big deal about all this stuff? And I hate documentation. Maybe I'm not the right person for this talk. I'll wing it. I don't like documentation. This is me circa like a year ago. Um, the main reason I didn't like documentation because it felt like a lot of process. It felt really heavy. And I hate process. I hate meetings. I hate anything that gets in the way of me doing actual work. And it really feels like you know, any sort of upfront planning is just useless. Um, so I'm really skeptical of this sort of stuff. But most importantly, I don't like to help people. <laughs> and this is, this is kind of the important thing. Like, this is how we're all um, sort of like this. And like, yes, if, if what I do ultimately helps people, that's great. But when you come down to it, like, I don't want to do something for my manager. I don't want to do something for users. Like, first and foremost, I want it to help me. And if that stuff happens down the line, that's great. But I'm not going to do something unless I find direct benefit to me. And I think that's important if you're looking for um, any sort of development mentality of if it's going to help me, and then, then you're going to do it. So documentation should be selfish. I think that's really important. And I don't think it's a bad thing to say. I think um, as long as you get into a system that you are comfortable with, I think that's a good thing. So these are the three things that I found documentation to be helping me the most. And these are what I'm going to cover today. Um, first and foremost, this stuff has helped my Ruby a lot. I know a lot of people who they, they get to the keyboard and they start typing code and just like beauty flows from their keyboard and like, in, like out of their fingers and stuff. I get to the keyboard and just like sewage runs through my fingers into the, the, you know, vim or whatever I'm using. And I can write beautiful code. I really can, but it's, it's really difficult for me. I have to really think and I have to be conscious about like, how is this going to be designed? How am I actually going to tackle this? Um, and documentation in a variety of different ways has helped me write better code. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit later. Secondly, tests. When you have better Ruby, you write better tests. And documentation, the act of writing documentation has helped me really figure out how do I test stuff, how, what edge cases do I want to test, um, the whole gamut of that stuff. And I'll get into that later. But first, I want to talk about projects. I love projects. Um, I, I write lots of little Sinatra apps, write little stupid gems, I write Ruby libraries, you know, a whole slew of things. And I really like the idea that you can do really small 
projects and ship them and you know, have a good time. So it was important for me if I could find a mentality that would work and help me produce really good projects as fast as possible, that's an ultimate win for me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about readme-driven development, and this was mentioned a little bit yesterday, and we'll dive into it a little bit more today. Um, readme-driven development was invented by this guy. Jesus! This is frightening. We're going to find a little bit better photo for him. <laughs> so this is Tom Preston Warner, uh, Mojombo. He's a uh, co-founder at GitHub, so he's one of my bosses, which is why I'm talking about it. We get docked pay unless we have three. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm talking about all this stuff because it's really cool, and this has really changed how I work and how we work at GitHub. Um, so readme-driven development, step one, you write re your readme. Step two, there's no step two. And I really apologize, that was the worst joke ever. Um, and everybody uses it, but I couldn't help. Um, but that's really all there is. You, you, you sit down, you write readme. You write um, you know, installation steps. You write how the public API is going to be handled, or how um, you know, different to-do items, or whatever you want to write for a good readme. Um, you just write that first, the whole thing, before you write a lick of code, lick of tests, anything else. Um, this is the reason why. Developers have this thing where if you have a cool project idea, the first thing that you think of is the most interesting part. If you're going to write some sort of like, you know, mini app, you can say, oh, well, this one component, this real-time component, I mean, that will be challenging, that will be fun, I want to get into that right now, I can like do some cool inheritance and like go crazy. And everybody in this room has had the time where they did something like that, and then they spent hours on it, or days, or weeks, and then like, you know, days or weeks later, you realize that's a pile of horseshit. There's so much code, I didn't need that, I could shell out to another library, and I didn't, it was, you jumped too fast into the interesting part, and you didn't think about what the end result is, be that a public API, or uh, you know, the ultimate web app, or um, anything like that. So, readme driven development, you are, you're, the, the first thing you do with that is put yourself in your user's shoes. Like, how do you install it? What is the end product? What am I delivering to them? And that's, that's for me, that was really important to figure out how do I build something? Because at that point, I just read my readme as I'm building it, and it just tells me what to do. Secondly, readmes are all over the place. I mean, they're, they're your root of your directory, but they're also on GitHub. We put the readme in you know, the front page of your repo underneath all of your code, and it's really visible. People like seeing well-written readme. So go to town, like do some cool formatting, put in images, put in you know, whatever you want. This is the document that will be there that will impress people. And if you can do that first, I mean, it's just, just it becomes a foundation of your project rather than the last thing you do before you ship it. Secondly, this is the little pro tip. Readme is working subdirectories, at least on GitHub. Um, and by that I mean they show up if you're going through directories and you click through subdirectory, subdirectory. We'll show the readme if we find one for that subdirectory. And that stuff is kind of hidden, and it's really interesting. Uh, Rick Olson was writing Stratocaster at GitHub as an internal library to handle all of our events, like repo created, issue commented on, stuff like that, all of your newsfeed items. And it's a big project, and it's a separate project, but you need a hook into the GitHub code. So in like lib uh, slash Stratocaster, he has a separate readme detailing just the Stratocaster stuff. So if a month or two down the line, I figure out, well, I, there's a bug in this, I want to check it out. The readme is right there, and it's contained just to that topic, and it's really helpful. So give that one a thought um, if you're working on something similar in the future. Everyone loves a good readme. It's a living document. Re writing your readme first does not mean you write it, and then you're done. Like, the best readme, if you do it first, you keep building on it. If you change your stuff down the line, change your readme. It's a living document. It wants to be changed. And then by the end of it, it's a great document to have. Everybody loves a readme. Everyone hates a shitty readme. And everyone has been to those shitty readmes. So that's readme-driven read development. Um, I want to go on to a little bit different topic right now. And first I want to jump, in, jump into a problem we have all sort of faced. Stuff like this. So you see like this, you're refactoring something, and you see like no method error, and you are obviously wondering what the hell these methods are, but you know, you try and dig into that next. So you dig into that method, and you first realize this is a terrible method, you should probably refactor this, but you know, we're trying to figure out how to fix this, so first, you know, we see that this is a method call, and then you call in the third in the array, and then you call tonight, so obviously the third one has gotta be nil, so you dive into this next method, 
in this next method all it says three method calls inside of an array so there's something wrong with the whiskey that passes in tab you go into the whiskey and then it goes it's another module that has analyze and you analyze the tab and then you go into the module and then there's just more code and you have to deal with all this shit it's insane I mean it's a contrived example but everybody's been into this sort of stuff where um, you, 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 you have to reconstruct all of these method calls mentally and yes you can do that that is not a big deal we're humans we're reasonably smart um, but you shouldn't have to um, it's it's we are not Ruby interpreters and we should be able to rely on something else that tells us how to deal with all of this stuff instead so that's where inline documentation comes in for github this is really big for us um, we're past the point of the first year or two where our business may collapse we have a good idea of how to host git repos we are, have a good idea to make money stuff like that and it's very unlikely in the next two or three years like suddenly it will just not work there will be problems obviously but we're in a different stage of our development where now the big problem is how do we continue our growth how do we have code that is clean and still worthwhile to read and it doesn't slow us down like that's the number one concern um, and we've done pretty well at that and one of the best things we've done is inline documentation which we will get into because we use TomDoc, which is invented by, Jesus. All right, invented by that guy again. TomDoc, Tom Preston Warner. TomDoc is a very simple way of adding inline documentation to your method calls. Um, for an example, this is just a fake method called add mustache. Adds a mustache to an image. Um, this may or may not exist in lots of different ways in the GitHub code base. No comment. Um, so basically, this is your simple method, and then assume it does something cool in there. This is the Tom doc for it. So let's step through this real quick. First is uh, you say whether or not it's a public method. So from the start, you are uh, contemplating how do I present this internal API to other users. If it's public, you say public. If it's not, just omit it, and then it's considered a private method, and it's, it's, it's important to denote that stuff. Secondly, you add the sort of the traditional comment you may add to a method in terms of just describe it. Give it a high-level language, really simple overview of like, how does this work? This adds a mustache to an image. Pretty simple. If the actual implementation was really complex, that's really helpful to figure out what the hell this actually does. You actually have to read code. Humans are better at this than reading code. Secondly, you, li you label your arguments. So in this case, we're passing in an image, which is just a string path to a local image on disk. This it can sometimes be tricky to see the value in this, um, but consider the point when you're passing in hashes, which is what Rubyists do all the time. And you have like the question of, is this value gonna be in this hash? Is this value gonna be in array? Um, in this case, you would detail, you know, if there's a hash passed in, say this is the hash, and then you detail like, this will have the name parameter, it'll have the URL parameter, it'll have all this other stuff. And you have a very concrete, uh, detailed view of what you're passing into this method. Next, you have examples. Um, just show how you do it. Um, this, is, this can be really important. It can be less important. Some methods, you don't actually have to have this block. We have some methods in GitHub where we'll have um, like a two or three line uh, internal method that's really important. Like it actually handles your repositories on disk. And we'll have 10, 12, 13 examples of how to deal with it because it's so important. You don't want to have to deal through the code base to try and figure out where have I done this before and can I just copy and paste that in? This is the best place to say, if, if you're passing in a string here, this happens. If you're passing in a, an array here, this happens. Um, it can be incredibly important to have this sort of concrete examples right there, right in the middle of code that you're gonna be using. And then finally, um, just tell it what it returns. Does it return a string? Does it return an array? Does it return a string or an array, depending on the input? Um, if it's a hash, detail the hash. Um, it's, it's, it's just another way of figuring out explicitly what is happening in that method. So that's what TomDoc is. Why is this important to us? First of all, it's plain text. I like TomDoc because I like TomDoc in the same way I like Markdown. Markdown is, you know, it, you don't have to render it to really figure out what is happening. You have, you know, italics and stuff, and you're like, obviously that's probably important, but it's not interrupting how I read it. Same way with TomDoc. Um, I don't want to hate on like RDoc or anything like that. Um, if you're using that, that's great. It's just the same thing but a different flavor. For me, I really like the idea that there's no hidden like um, internal method calls and stuff like that that you have to learn. You don't want to have to learn a new language to read documentation. 
This also works if you're using this in other languages too. Um, RDoc will not transfer to JavaScript as well. Um, secondly, it's English. This is what I was talking about earlier. People know their native language a lot better than they know programming. And just having a you know, simple way of describing this is what this method does, a simple way of figuring out this is what this method returns, and examples, all of that stuff helps you figure out what this method actually does and how you can use it. Finally, explicit, um, also important. I mean, this is how you avoid the whole method chain interpolation in your mind. You can just, uh, just reassure yourself that the documentation is telling you what you should be expecting. And then you can look in there and be like, oh, well, this is not returning the right thing, and then you can attack that method directly. Um, the same thing with arguments. Just having those detailed, having the hashes detailed when relevant is just super important. And flexible, this is the other thing that like, for me, TomDoc is really awesome because it's really flexible. It's not trying to dictate some sort of dogma. If you don't want examples, don't include examples. If you don't want to do uh, the arguments, don't do them. If it's just too simple, if, it, if you should figure it out on your own, just don't do them. Most of my TomDoc methods are just the top line, what it does, and then space, and then the bottom line, what it returns. And that's perfectly fine. The, the point is to find something that works for you, and in each case, what works best for that case. So I was telling you what this is, how this has improved me as a coder. So in terms of Ruby, how does this make it better? Tiny methods. If you're writing TomDoc or any sort of documentation, you're forced to figure out what's actually happening in this method. And it's, it sticks out like a sore thumb if you're going through and you're typing all this stuff like, well, you know, in this case, this returns this or this returns this, and it's like, it's really complicated. And as you're typing that, you're realizing this is insane. Why don't I split this up into like six, seven, eight methods, if need be, or two methods? Um, and it, it, it just becomes a lot better. You have tiny methods, it's very clear, and you just have to deal with less overhead mentally. Along those lines, you have smarter methods. You have, you know, why would you want to document this like seven parameter hash if you don't have to? It forces yourself to think like, maybe I can pass in just a string argument. Do I actually need the whole data model there? Can I split this up a different way? It's just another step of saying, how can I do this stuff better than I currently am? Tests. Better Ruby code leads to better tests. And all of the stuff that I just said means you're gonna have better tests. You have smaller methods, you have more concrete methods, they only deal with specific items that they're concerned with. Um, it's just a lot easier to write tests. It knows you're in your put output. If you're talking about like, what is inputting? If you have some crazy hash input in, that translates to a test a lot better. You don't have to actually have to think like, oh, where is this get called from? What's getting sent in? You just look at the docs and then write the test from there. Same thing with edge cases. They stick out like a sore thumb. If, if you have a conditional in there and you're saying like, well, you know, if this is nil, do this differently, um, those should all be test cases. It translates very well between implementation to documentation to tests. So I mean, we do TomDoc a lot. I mean, we do our Ruby, we do like JavaScript. I mean, everything that we touch ends up being TomDoc because it, it I mean, we were, we're 40 people at this point and it's, we're getting too big to be able to just push code out there and expect other people to figure out what's going on. Because there's lots of edge conditions when you're at the scale that we are. Um, and the, the more communicative we can be to each other, uh, the, the, the stronger the code base we ultimately have. So this talk was sort of a, a, a rage reaction to a blog post I had in June. Um, and usually if you do like a controversial blog post, you get the sort of response where like, yeah, I mean, documentation's all right, but I kind of do this other way. Apparently on this blog post, people are mostly like, yeah, fuck documentation. I don't document anything. I write 200,000 lines of code. It's all perfect. And then they walk off the stage, because they're on a stage. Um, I don't understand. I want to talk about some of the reactions to some of this. My code is perfect. I think that's bullshit. I have stuff that last week I'm proud about, and I see this week, and I have no idea what I was doing. I mean, we've all been there. Like, it's, it's, code is complicated. And the stuff you write today may be used for the next two years. It's important that you have a good foundation of how that code is done, and you just go from that point forward. No one, no one updates documentation. This is a big deal. Um, this is true, in some regards. This should not happen. We gotta get away from this perspective of documentation is always stale. That shouldn't happen because you should update documentation as you update the implementation. This is the true for inline code, 
uh, code comments, this is true for readmes, um, this is true for wikis, anything you end up, end up doing, you've got to get away from the idea that changing implementation means you can skimp on documentation. That shouldn't happen. Too verbose, um, it is verbose. Uh, if you start writing stuff like this, like TomDoc in particular, um, it is verbose, but it's something that you cling on to because it's a, a standard practice that you get into the habit. And again, like if you come into the idea that you don't need a, uh, an example in everyone, that's fine. Just do it how you want to do it. The important part is figuring out a process that works for you. Um, and you know, if you don't want that verbosity everywhere, just don't do it. Finally, uh, people have their w intentions in weird places. They're like, I put all of my intentions in my uh, git commit messages. Therefore, I can go back and check them out. Or my tests are my documentation. They have all my edge cases, all of my you know, different concerns I'm dealing with, so therefore I check my tests. I think that's bullshit. No one does that. No one looks through the whole test because your test file could have tests for the same method in totally different places because it's broken out by different concerns. No one looks at, no one runs git log to try and figure out what some way's original intention is. They like to say they do, but they actually don't. What you want to do is have your code next to your documentation so it's right there and you can actually look at it. Um, this stuff's important to us. Again, like this is what's making GitHub as stable as it is right now. Uh, we really push hard on this um, and we're really happy with it. So I want to encourage you to at least give it a shot. Like I'm a big proponent of anti-dogma and all this stuff. For me, test-driven development, you know, BDD, agile, all that stuff never worked for me because it, it just didn't. And I rec recognize that it works for tons of other people. Um, and if that works for you, that's great. If this stuff works for you, that's great as well. And I just think that we need more documentation stressing, uh, we need to stress documentation in more places than we do currently. So that's what I got. Any questions? I'm Holman. Ask me. I love you guys. No cat calls. Yes. Um, question was, was it always TomDoc or we moved from something else? Um, TomDoc sort of started um, seriously maybe like a year into the code base, I think, which meant that there was probably, I don't know, five or six active developers on the code base. So there was less structured anything. Um, we never started in RDoc or anything like that. Um, and then about a year, or like two years ago at this point, we started adding more and more. And now we get to the point where like, we still have lots of places that have no documentation. And you know, if you see that Adam now, and it's just as relevant as adding you know, implementation code too. TomDoc originally, I believe this, the, the wording was, Linus has Linux, therefore I should have TomDoc. <laughs> Can't fault the man. Yes, Redshirt Isle. So the question was, uh, what's the best, or what's the single most important thing to Im to help your developers improve documentation for the team? When, when you're on, like, when you're in a team that has to do with client post deadlines and kind of restrictions. So relevant to client was the rest of the question. Um, working with clients. Um, I mean, I have to do this from the perspective of I work on product. And we have the luxury, we have no deadlines at GitHub, so that's a bit of a benefit. Um, and we can do stuff like this. I don't feel like any of the stuff that I've mentioned today really takes that much more time. Um, I never sit down and spend an hour on TomDoc. And I feel like it's, it just seems to go hand in hand with code. Um, if you're gonna write the code, just write the docs. And it's not that much further. And you know, more often than not, I find that I save a lot of time writing that up front and then writing the code than going down the rabbit hole, writing terrible code, and then having to fix it later. Yes? Um, parts. Um, so is your process write the doc, write the test, then implement the code? So the question is, what is the process um, of writing this stuff? I, I don't subscribe to anything. 
Um, sometimes I'll, I will uh, do the entire module or class and do all the methods and then Tom dock it. And then you know, sometimes I'll write the test then and then I'll go back and write the implementation after all of that. Sometimes I'll just do the methods first and then dock it later, do tests later. Um, I'm not a stickler for any of it really. Um, it's just up to whatever makes sense in that situation, what you're comfortable with. Second question. I'm already on top of it. I Tom docked that response. Yes. There are a couple. Um, Chris Wanstroff wrote one a while ago. Um, I think, I mean, my opinion on that and Tom's opinion on that is more of we find it less interesting. Um, the, the reason for Tom Doc is more you're diving into the code of somebody else's library. How do you understand it best? Not like, uh, like a generated view of somebody's documentation and code. Um, and there's certainly ways to do it. Um, Yard has a Tom Doc generation hook, I believe. Um, but that, that, in some respects, it almost seems a lot different use case than what it was originally intended for. So. Um, Yes. Yes. Um, you would want generated code for stuff like Rails. You're saying, or generated docs. Um, I feel like generated docs are only more helpful for things that I don't dig into the code for, where I'm just totally an end user, like Ruby, like Rails. Um, and then if I'm using something like Omnia, more often than not, it goes straight into the code. And I feel like it's sort of less helpful to um, look at a generated listing of docs based from like a, a small <coughs> library like that. Maybe that's just me, but. Yes? Do you have a process for suggestions where you have in mind documentation that we can have up to date with code changes, especially where it's going to go to developers? Yeah, so the question is uh, do you have a process for changing or updating documentation when you change the implementation? That is the process. When you update code, you have to change the docs. And like, it's, we're, it's, we're just a stickler for, for that. Um, and if you see somebody changing something without changing the docs, you yell at them, and it's usually not that big of a deal. But it is sort of a mental mode that you have to get into where those two things are linked. And it's usually not that bad because they're literally on top of each other. So. Yes? Is there an operative for repeat talks? A what? An operative for repeat talks? An operative what? Upward, Upward, Upward limit. limit for readme sizes. No. One of my favorites is uh, uh, Tom was actually first starting readme driven development on Gollum, uh, the, the get back wiki on GitHub. And it's, it's a massive readme. And I, I've gone back and forth. It was actually, we were talking about this in the danger room on Campfire about like, where do you break stuff out of the readme into the wiki? And yeah, do you just throw point everything point. into it? Hmm? I guess that's where you Yeah. Um, I, I, I go back and forth. I think some things like wikis make a lot of sense if they're totally outside of the scope of a readme. On the other hand, I love just a fat readme that just goes for pages. You can just like, you know, command F and look what you're, find what you're looking for and I'm cool with that. Um, so the question is uh, sort of merging tests and comments in some fashion. Um, yes, we've thought about that. Um, more from like, wouldn't that be cool? But it never seemed like a feasible way to do that because there's so many best practices in Ruby already. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you.